Hope everyone's doing well. Welcome to Coach's Connection. Today's speaker is Rod Underwood. He will be discussing the topic of coach's identity and how to establish a positive team environment, which later will allow individuals within the team to become successful. Enjoy. Well, guys, guys I'm glad you guys are uh, excited to get on. It's always exciting. I mean, this time it's been crazy. Uh, as Sean and I were talking about, we've been on so many calls and Zoom meetings and all these other things and just everyone's dying for interaction. And, and what I found in this time really is that um, what I found in this time is that it's a time really to grow and, and look at yourself and evaluate all the things that, um, that, you know, that you've been doing in your life and that you've been doing in the game. And because I think those things are really important because what happens is the game takes over our life. And when the game takes over our life, we forget about some of the other things that we need to grow into. And that's what's really important, I think, about you know, your coaching identity. And the first thing I will say is the coaching identity has to be uh, genuine. What do I mean by that is the, the, uh, it has to be you. And what I, one thing that is really sort of I've thought about a lot as of late, probably the last year or so, a couple of years, especially watching football all around the world, and especially, and, and I know a lot of people might disagree, but the way that Barcelona changed the game, you know, in the, in the 2000s and the way Pep coached the games in the 2000s. And something I thought about last year that was very interesting to me is um, I spent last year, I went through probably, I would say, 200 games of the Premier League. And I looked at where goals came from. I looked at how goals were scored and all that said and done, the number of five old games, four old games in the premier league were simply, if you look at the games, there were games where other teams and other coaches tried to play the way that man city played. And it really wasn't their personality. It really was, it really wasn't who they were as a coach and their identity. And I think that had a real big influence because Whatever your identity is as a coach has to be you. There cannot be, for me, I, I like this word, iota, the smallest amount, right? There can't be one iota about your identity that's not genuine, that you don't believe in, that you don't trust. From no matter what anybody else says, you have to trust it and you have to believe in it. Because if you don't, it's really difficult. Uh, it's really difficult to really, I would say, impose, influence your players and, and, and influence the game. That's why your identity has to be genuine. It can't be, you can steal ideas from other coaches. You can like coach X or Y or Z, but if it doesn't fit you, it's not gonna, you're not gonna reach that, you're not gonna reach that 100% of you. And that's really what it's all about as a coach. Do you reach the 100% of you? Your 100% of you might be better than 99 other coaches. But if you have, 30% of you, 20% of this coach, 30% of that coach, you're not going to be the coach that you really are. You're going to be 100% of you. All right? Sean, do I have to hit something to change the slide or you change the slide? Okay, perfect. So, guys, what I did here is, look, these are, these are my ideas of things that have influenced me. So I talked about core value, communication, leadership. Signature is an interesting one. Branding. And then no words. And that, that's another interesting one to me. So the first thing I'm going to look at is core values, right? So in your core values, right, they don't change. Just like as a coach, your core values about the game don't change. You might make decisions. You might make decisions and you might tweak things based on opponent, based on a particular team you're playing against, based on a particular individual. But the core values don't change. And so on the next slide, what I have put up is, is my core values, what I think are important for me, all right? Those are, those are, that's what I've said. Okay, these are the things that are important to me. Next slide, please. So number one, high moral standards. Look, guys, in today's world with social media, with uh, the, the small network, right, the small network that we have, we're sitting, I'm sitting in, Tacoma, Tacoma, Washington, right? You guys are where you are, but I guarantee you in our circles, we all know someone. 
We all know someone that knows us or we have some relationship with someone. So having a high moral standard is really important because I know a lot of guys that are good coaches, but they're not anywhere in the game because of their lack of moral standards. And I learned that the hard way. Don't get me wrong, guys. I'm, I've been in this game almost 50 years, all right, as a player, as a coach. And I've learned I've, some of those things I've learned the hard way, right? And so that's why, I'm, that's why that's important for me, your high moral standard, all right? And then integrity. You have to have it. You have to have it. Because what I say is, right, you might not be the best coach, but if you got a high moral standard and you got lots of integrity, people will have time for you. People will want to be able to, to know you, to be part of you, right? Trust, being trustworthy. No question. Your word's a word, all right? You know, there, there was a day and time in the world that you didn't need to sign a contract. Like someone would say, I'm going to do it, and they would do it. That doesn't exist anymore. You know, and even when I sign a contract, it's like, I really want to sign this contract. I know I'm going to follow through what I say I'm going to do. But because others will not, it's good to have the contract. So you got to be, your words got to be your bond. Your words got to be who you are. And, and again, I'm talking about personal core values about who you are as an individual. Throw the soccer coach away. If you're, throw the dad, if you're a dad, throw the husband away. If you're, throw all those things away. You, when you lay your head down at night, can you be satisfied with your high moral standards? Can you be satisfied with your integrity? Can you be satisfied with your trustworthiness? Can you be? That's the question you have to ask yourself every single day. It's not something that it happens overnight. It's every day you have to ask those questions, being honest. That speaks for itself, right? Because a lot of your players, they will find out. Because what I've said is this, especially in today's game with so many players getting high education levels and going to Stanford, going to UCLA's, going to Duke's, going to Harvard's. A lot of those guys are smarter than you. A lot of those girls are smarter than you. They can read you, all right? They can know you. So, so again, it sounds like I'm saying you're being honest for somebody else so that people will trust you. No, you're being honest for yourself. Because again, if you're honest, right, about you will live a better life, inclusive. Now, this is a very interesting one because as a person, you need to be inclusive, all right? And what I mean by that is, it doesn't matter what you think about someone's personal life. You don't have to agree with it. You don't have to think they're right or like what they do. You don't have to any of that. But what you do have to do is you have to respect them as a person. They're human, you're human, and that's it. There's plenty of people and plenty of things in the world that I don't agree with, but I don't disrespect people. And I, it, because forget about the game. It's just not right. Because if any of us have been in an environment where people have thought less of us, look less of us, and they've kept us outside the circle, all right? And I, and I just share this, right? Because like my mom and dad were born in the 40s, right? And in the 40s, they were born in the 40s in a little small town in Mississippi, all right? When, when things were difficult for African-Americans, right? And even if my mom was five and there's a kid that was another color, Next to her, she couldn't say, hey, Susie. She'd say, hey, Mrs. So-and-so. So when I say inclusive, I, I take these from past experience and things. That I grew up in the South. I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, played, played in Atlanta, one of the first, black, the first black player to play at my college, Furman University. Uh, so I've experienced some of those things. But to be inclusive, it just makes you a better person. And then you talk about the team, if you're inclusive especially coaching youth, right? It's really easy to say, I've got 18 players on my team. I've got five really good players, but I got three guys I don't want to play at all. I only play them because they paid their money to play on my team. That's not being inclusive. That's just being, you're just doing your, you're just doing your duty. But being inclusive means is put those players in the forefront sometimes in training. Help them. When you pick teams, let them be the captains. All these things to be inclusive, all right? And the last thing for me is, my faith, right? And it's real simple. I say, I, I say this for myself. Your conscience. If my conscience can only see what's five yards in front of me, then I have a problem. But if I believe in something greater that's very difficult for me to grasp, 
I will always try to reach to a next level. And I will always have, I will no longer just be thinking about me, I'll be thinking about others. So it goes to inclusive, it goes to being honest, it goes to being trustworthy, having integrity, having a high moral standard. For me, I'm not saying, again, guys, I push nothing on no one. I just, I'm a very transparent guy and I say what I see and I say what I believe and I say what's me, all right? And I think that's important for you guys to understand because it's real easy to be in a circle, right, of, of coaches. And you're talking about a game, right? You're talking about some particular game and your view of the game is way different than everybody else in the circle. But you're quiet because you don't want to stir anything up. Don't be quiet. Don't be afraid of your ideas. Don't be afraid of who you are because you know what? That's going to make you better. And we all want to be better, right? We all want to be better. That's really important. Next slide. So developing leadership style. And that's something that takes time, right? Because when I first started the game, when I first started coaching, give you a quick I coached my first team at about 16 years old. I went back to the place where I first started playing when my mom was my coach when I was about five or six years old. And then about 16, I went back there and I, I helped, I coached the team, right? And then I started getting on my coaching license at an early age. By the time I was 25, 26, I had my A license already. By the time 25, 26, while I was still playing professionally. But right when I got into coaching and really got deep into coaching, my mind was still as a player. So I was like very like in the player mentality, right? If the player didn't do it, because you know how the feel uh, if you played the game and your teammates is not on it, right, man? You're on them, right? You're saying, hey, wh what's up, dude? What's happening? Why is this not happening, right? And so that's where I was as a coach in the beginning, right? And when I first started coaching, like, it, was, it wasn't okay, but it worked because that's the way the world was, all right? You could be that way. The world's changed. Things are different, all right? And you can see transformative, right? For me, that is vital. What do I mean by transformative leadership style? My personal mention statement is to impact culture and change lives using the game. That's my number one focus in the game. Look, guys, I've coached everywhere except on the full national team. I've had opportunity to do all these different things. But for me, can I be a transformative leader for every player that I come in contact with? That's what drives me. Do I want to win everything? Yes, I'm going to win everything. I'm like any other coach. But if I win everything and don't influence a player to have a transformative leadership style, then I've not done, I've not done what I've needed to do. Yeah, I've won games. Yeah, I've got trophies. Yeah, I've got rings. Yeah, I've got championship T-shirts. Yeah, everyone pats them on the back. But if I haven't changed a life that they could go on and influence and impact later on in their lives, my leadership style is nothing. Inclusive. Again, I use the word again. It has to be inclusive. When, you, when your leadership style has to be inclusive, if you got at the professional level, you got 25 guys on the team, everyone needs to be part of that team. Every single player, without a doubt. When, when I was coaching in Sacramento as assistant head coach in 2014, the one thing that we said was is that we don't care what people say outside of our group. All we care about is what happens within our group. And everybody was important. When we won the championship in 2014, there were guys that were in the game that helped us win the game that only maybe played half of the games all year. But they were ready because every training session was inclusive. Every communication was inclusive. When we had team meals, they were inclusive. Guys didn't always just click up and stay together. Everything worked. Everything went on. Everything moved. It was so important for us. Demanding. My leadership style is very demanding, but transformative. My leadership style is very demanding, but influential. My leadership style is demanding, but also a servant leader. And what do I mean by all of that? What I mean is, as first as a servant leader, I'm there for you as the person before I'm there for you as the coach. If I'm there for you as the player and then the person, it's not going to work. I have to be there for you as the person first, then the player. Because I'm there for you as the, as the, as the person who trusts me. You will believe that I have the best interest for you within the team. And that's really important. Demanding, though, hey, I expect you to show up every day. I expect you to show up every day and work. I expect you to show up every day and 
give everything that you had. And then when you think you gave it all, find a way to go more. Empowering. I empower every single one of my players to be individual thinkers within the framework of the team. There was a time a couple of years ago, a player came off the field and said, hey, coach, this is not working. I said, okay, tell me what works then, man. Tell me what works. I don't have all the answers. How about all the, I'm not, just because I'm the coach, I mean, I have all the answers. Tell me, tell me, how do we fix this? What do you see? That's empowering. That's empowering, right? Because if I empower my players to be thinkers, then guess what? My team is better. Guess what? Who benefits? It's a team. Guess what? Who benefits? The individual. That is what is so important. Empower your players. Because if I empower my players in the framework of the team, if they are a dad, they'll learn how to empower their kid. So it goes back to being a transformative leader. If they're a husband, they empower their wives to do to make decisions without them, knowing that, that, that he's got, his, got her back. Same thing with the team. If I empower my players, I know coach has got my back. Yeah, I might, my decision might be wrong, but coach is never going to, because he's been inclusive, because he's empowered me, he's not going to put me in a situation where he doesn't have my back. Transactional. Plain and simple. You go to, the, go to Starbucks. You ask for a latte. You give your, you give your card. They give you, your, they give you your, uh, your drink, right? Same thing in, in football. Same thing. There are days when I'm just a simple transactional leader where it's like, hey, I want you to do this. I don't want to talk about it. This is my expectation today. And that's it. But I can only do that because I've been inclusive. I can only do that because I've been empowering. I can only do that because I've been transformative. Do you see? There's not one that's superseding the other. Because when I first started coaching, I was demanding and not much else on this, on this slide here. I was demanding. Why? Because that's the way I was about myself as, as a player. No one, I didn't need a coach to pat me on the back and tell me, hey, wow, that was a good game. You know what? Guess what? I know when I played good. I know when I didn't play good. I just, so I had to change that personality, right? And I still have that personality. I still have that personality, right? Even with my kids. At home, I have twins that are eight-year-old, and then I have a, a son that's 13. I have an older dog that's 27. But even with my kids, sometimes I have to take off the coach's hat because I'm so demanding. You know, it's like, hey, you know what to do. Go do it. You know, instead of like, you know, they're eight years old. They don't quite know what to do. And so, you know, you, you get into those things. But all these things, being transformative, being inclusive, demanding, empowering, transactional. Now, but what I will say is this. This is me. This is who I am. What are you? You got to figure yourself out. You have to figure that out, right? Because, again, I've been doing this for almost 50 years, playing and coaching. And I, I, I'm at the stage now where I, I, this is who I am. This is what I, this is what I do. You know, I, I look at the last year and a half, right? I was interviewed for a job where uh, Landon Donovan was the co got the job. I was interviewed for another job where John Hart's got the job, and I was interviewed for another job where Pretty got the job. So you see the competition level there, right? Of the players that are there, right? And all those guys came. It came down to I was in the final two with each of those guys. What does that do with leadership style? What does that do with leadership style and who I am? No matter who I'm, no matter who or what I'm going up against, if my team's going up with a certain team, there's only one option to win. That's my mentality. That's my demanding mentality. A coach, I'm going up looking to get an opportunity for a job. I'm, it's going to be me. Maybe it's not me, but, it, but, but maybe it is me. But I'm not going to take on this persona of something that I don't have complete 100% belief and control in. That when I do, if I do get in the position, they were thinking one thing, but I'm some other way. Right? And that's not being honest. That's not being honest. That's not being genuine in who you are. I'll pause for a second. Anybody have any questions or any comments about what I've said so far? Rod, we're going to do the questions at the end of it. So if you want to just. Okay. So let's go into the next slide. Thank you. 
developing communication style, right? And we all know, right? The world is so different, right? There's technology communication, there is social media communication, you name it, there's so many things, right? But in the team framework, right? You have to be assertive, right? You have to be assertive. And what is, what is, what is assertive? Assertive is simply saying, you speak with confidence, you speak with power, you speak with authority, you speak with a belief, but it also has to be calming, all right? Because I know I've done it, right? I, we've all done it. Sometimes I, I, I like to say there was, a, there was a coach I had one time at the professional level. We would be winning the game going away, right? Just like going away. And he would come into the locker room and he would just have a fit. He would be mad about everything. And, you know, now I know that he was trying to keep us motivated, but, you know, we were all men. We're all men. You know, it doesn't work, right? So now, now when we're losing, he would be just the opposite. Like, man, who are you? What are you going to do, right? You know, because it was just the, the opposite of what, you know, what it was. But I think if you're assertive, right, you can still be calming, right? And something I like to do, right, especially at the professional level, I'll tell, I'll tell my coach, we'll walk in half and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be tough on the guys. I'm going to be really difficult on the guys first, and I'm going to walk out like I'm mad, and then I want you to come in, and I want you to calm them down and put your shirt. You know, so the, there's so many ways, right? Or, or I'll say things like going to be inclusive to my coaching staff. I say, hey, my assistant coach said, you speak first, and I'll speak. Because he might have a little, because the game might have been really difficult, right? And because me as a person, I'm like, when it comes to the game, I'm so intense, right? I'm ready to, I'm ready. If I could still play, I would, but my body doesn't let me play anymore. But I'm so intense, right? And in your communication, you have to be influencing everything. Do not leave anything for chance. Do not leave anything for chance. And that's why you have to influence. You influence every movement of every player. You try to influence every thought of every player. You try to influence every thought of every coach. But saying all that, they still feel empowered, going back to the previous slide, right? They still feel like they've been inclusive. Those are, those, are, those are tricky things, right? Those are tricky, tricky things, right? But again, through experience, right? Because again, if I pick anything off of these four things right here, in my beginning of coaching, I was probably just assertive. I don't think I was calming. I don't think I was really influencing. Inspiring, no. Educational, no. Because usually I came in in the locker room and I'm just like, a, I'm just like, I'm just like, I'm like a lion, right? On the prowl, looking, waiting and seeing for the right moment to attack. And that doesn't work. It does, rephrase that. It doesn't work over the long haul. And if you want something to be excellent and not just successful, which is two polar opposites in my mind, successful means that you can put a team together and win a championship. Excellent means that year in and year out, you're sitting and looking at the opportunity and potentially be the champion. That's, those are two different things. How you deal with those things are two different things. Inspiring. Going all the way back to the beginning, right? How do you be inspired? You inspire people by being inclusive. You inspire people by empowering them. You empower them by your core values, how you present yourself, how you show yourself. And then educational. Educational. Every time you speak, there, be, that, that, there must be something in your words that allow people to learn allow people to improve. Do not waste a word. Because the thing that drives me nuts about coaches are the ones that talk all the time or the ones that yell all the time. I yell, not all the time. But what drives me crazy is that all that talk, where's the education? Where's the, the halftime talk when you look at you're right back and you're, you're reaming him and you're being assertive and you're, you're really demanding a lot. What information you give him 
forgive her, that will help them solve the problems that were presented in the first half. And it will help them solve the problem that will be presented in the second half. If you're not an educational speaker, if you're not an educational communicator, you will lose your group. Because even, even if you've got a group that has unbelievable leaders, has unbelievable people that don't need, they don't need any outside inspiration. They just, they, they're motivated by themselves. They're self-motivated. If people don't feel like they're getting better and they're learning, it becomes a problem. It will be a problem. No doubt about it. Also, if you're not inspiring right every day, if you walk on the field and you are lack of energy, players can see that you're dragging yourself out. Players can see that training's supposed to start at 10 a.m. and you're there at 9.55 Players pick up on that. Players pick up on that. And if you're not influencing them, if you're not influencing them as a person, as a player, players pick up on that. Players see that maybe this guy's just in it for themselves. And if players begin to think you're in it for yourself, and I see so many youth coaches that they're just ticking the boxes, man. They're just ticking the boxes. All they want to do is, where's my next job? How can I get that next step? How can I do that? You cannot be successful if you're not present in the place that you're in. Because in my mind, where you are is where you're supposed to be. And maybe how difficult the circumstance and situation is, you're where you should be. And you should try to use the phrase, bloom where you are, right? Be the best where you are, all right? But always be calming, right? Always be calming. Always make the players feel a sense of relaxing. But when they get on the field, the tiger's alive, the tiger's in them, and they're ready to go. And that's what you have to get. Because if you don't, because if they're always calm, hey, man, what, I coach in the Caribbean, right? And that was one of the most difficult things, right? When I, my first job in the Caribbean was in Trinidad and Tobago, man. It was just crazy. It was crazy. And I, I coach national team players. I coach a few guys that are, for, for, the, for anybody on the call, I remember when Trinidad and Tobago played in the World Cup and they played England. Uh, I coached several of those guys, right? I think it was 2002 that they had played. Uh, I think it was 2002 that they played England in the, in the World Cup. I can't remember for sure. But I had several of those guys, right? And, man, I remember the first training session I had. And I said, training 10 o'clock, right? It's like 10 after 10. I got like five or six guys, man. I'm like, what's this, man? And then, you know, by 1030, the group's there. So the owner's there. I say, owner, what's up? He goes, oh, yeah, in the handbook, you know, they're not late until 30 minutes. He goes, this is what we do in the crib. I'm like, well, we're not gonna, I can't survive that way, man. But, you know, so you, you can have that other end of the calm and the laid back, and it's going to be difficult, right? Next slide, please. Signature. And I could have used another word, but I like signature. For me is your signature is people should be able to see who you are, right? without you saying a word. People should be able to see your team and know your philosophy, know your beliefs about the game, they, without, you, without you saying a word. How many coaches, right? How many coaches, think in your mind, we all have conversations, how many coaches you see, right? And they talk 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 and you see their teams like, man, you just liked me for the last half hour. Because this team, it's nothing like what you just said, man, you know, and um, so it's really important. So for me, my signature things, right, as a coach, when I go into a team, every player must perform with the ball. Every player. Every player must want the ball. Goalkeeper, right back, left back, center back, every player. Every single player, right? Why do I say that? And it's a funny thing. I just read a, uh, I just read a quote from Rio Ferdinand just yesterday, and they asked him who would he would prefer to have played with. Um, if any coach in the Premier League, what coach would he want to play with now? And he said, said Pep, said Pep Guardiola. And they said, why? He goes, because at Man United, we'd be winning four or five nil. And I would just be standing back there. And I would, I would never see the ball. And it was boring. He was, he was, he was talking to Vidic, I think, 
I think he was saying he had told that to Vidic after one game, walking through the tunnel. And Vidic says to him, why, man? He goes, we just won. He goes, what did I do? I didn't do anything. He goes, because if I was with, with Pep Guardiola, I, even when we're winning, the center back's always on the ball. The right back's on the ball. The left back's on the ball. So players must want the ball. For me, number one, players must want the ball. Players must be t- technically proficient to perform all the tasks that come their way in the game. Tactically. Players must be intelligent. And for me, that is like, that is like so vital. I want players that can make decisions. I take play, players, sometimes players shout at me off the side and say, hey, coach, what should I do? I said, I'm not playing, man. Make the decision. I've worked with you all week. Make the decision. And it frustrates me, it frustrates me sometimes because it's like, you got to make, you got to make the decision. So intelligent, highly intelligent players, right, are really important. And how do you become a highly intelligent player? You can be, a, you can be a, 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 how would I say it, a educated player in the sense of, you know, every system, you can talk the game, but can you influence the game with your intelligence and with your technical ability and wanting the ball all the time? Can you solve the problem? Can you solve the problem? Can you see the problem before the problem comes? And one of, one of my greatest experiences I ever had, uh, I worked with Preki, um, and we would be on the sideline, right? I was his assistant head coach. We on the sideline, like, why did you, after the game, I go, Preki, why'd you do that? Why'd you make the decision? Yeah, I saw this, this, and this, and then this, I knew this was going to happen a little bit later. I'm like, I never saw that. He goes, you know, but if you think, if, if any of you guys ever saw Preki play, there's actually something out now. I think uh, Sounders has put a nice little maybe 20, 25 minute uh, uh, video up of Preki and his journey. I think it was, uh, I think Keith Koskin, who's on Fox uh, and does the Bundesliga stuff, uh, announces for the, he did, he did the interview. And, um, but it's just, you, you got to study the game, right? You got to study the game. You can study the game by watching video. You can study the game by reading books. But what I like to do is, I like to go, especially when I'm trying to design a training session, I like to go stand right on the field and look at the places where I'm trying to train, look at the things I'm trying to train from the perspective of being right in those places. And then I begin to feel it and I begin to sense it. I mean, again, then I can begin to really put it together how it should be because it's easy to draw up a training session on a piece of paper. And how many of us, how many of us have drawn a session on a piece of paper? It's like, oh man, this is not going to work. When you start laying the cones down and you start seeing players, who, that's not going to work. I like to get that feel, right? I like to get that really, get that feel of where it's going to happen in the game. And even your training sessions, make sure that you put things to play, right? Put the, put the exercise in the place where they're, gonna, where they're going to happen on the field. If you're going to defending, work in the final third. If you're working on the right back and the left back, have sessions set up for the right side of the field, left side of the field, that you move back and forth. So it's all these things, right? Physical work. There is no excuse in my mind for a player not being fit at any age. No excuse. If a player cannot be fit, a player is not willing to work. I know that, look, my formal education is in exercise science, and I know how things have evolved. I know how things have of have have changed but i still believe that pushing players to the limit and then have them figure out is there a, is there a higher ceiling for them i think that's really important so I always tell my players beginning of the season i don't care if a team hammers us but one thing they will never do is they will never outwork us they will never 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 outwork us because, look, for me at the professional level, it's entertainment, but you got to win. Pay, people play, pay whatever they pay to come to a game. And if you don't, and if you do not put in the effort and have your team prepared to put in the best effort, you might lose. But... The fans still might applaud you because they can see there's a legitimate, 
genuine effort to work. Because I know sometimes, you know, I'll take my wife to games and we'll, you know, go to some big games and she'll say, I thought that player was supposed to be good. They're lazy. You know, and that, that's from the layman seeing, seeing things. But in some ways, she's right. And that's what, but regardless of what we think, she's a fan. That's what the fans see, right? Psychological mental strength. For me is, you can't be afraid to fail. You can't be afraid to fail. If, you, if you're afraid to fail, you won't succeed. You know, I, there was, I had very, and this is always hard for me, and I don't want to come across the wrong way. As a player, I pretty much had all success I could imagine as a player. As a coach, I've won a lot of things. I've won a lot of things. I've won a lot of championships at every level. But one thing, right, the mental strength. I've been in situations, right? I've been in situations. I, I, let, me, let me give you an example. I was coaching in another Caribbean country and kind of a violent country, drug country, a lot of drugs, a lot of gangs. And so we go to this game, right? And so I'm walking, out, I'm walking onto the bus, right? You know, I'm getting on the bus because you know, the, the island's small. So I think the bus ride may be an hour to the next game, right? To the, to the opponent, hour and a half to the opponent, something like that. So not very far drive. So I asked my assistant, I, my personal assistant, and I say, who's this person? Oh, that's just your bodyguard. Because if we win the game there, you're going to be the first one to get out because the fans are going to come after you. And so the guy's got a gun in his hip and blah, 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 right? But my first thought is, oh, my God, what have I gotten into? And then I started to think about this. And then, then my mind went right away to, oh, I'm excited. I'm looking forward to this, to go into that hostile environment. But that was my mental approach, right? That was my mental way of seeing things. And your signature style of play, that's obvious. Will your style of play be exactly like you wanted it to be. Look at Man, look at Pep from Barcelona to Man City, excuse me, to Bayern to Man City. His core values have not changed. The quality of player in some ways have changed because in my mind, you know, Messi's there, when Xavi was at his heyday, Iniesta, even, you know, these guys, right? I don't know if there's any other guys in his groups at Bayern or at Man City, we're at that level when they're at their highest level. They could do the things that they could do. That's just my personal opinion. But his style, his, his core style of play hasn't changed. Build out of the back, possess the ball, overloads, play the half faces, play in the gaps. None of that has changed. He's tweaked it based on the personality, but every time you walk on the, every time you turn the TV on, you should, you'll see a style of play. Every time your teams walk on the field, can someone see your style of play? Know that this is your signature. So this, is, this may be one of the most important slides for you guys is create your signature. Create your signature as a coach so that when anybody wants to hire you, they can say, oh, yeah, that's so-and-so. He plays like this, this, and this. And I tell my players, right? I tell my players. Find yourself doing something that nobody else can do that when a coach is looking for you at the higher level or for a bigger team, they can say, he does this and nobody can do that what he does. Next slide, please. Personal branding. This is an interesting one because like I'm, I'm sort of trying to be in it, but of my age, I haven't, I didn't, I didn't grow up in it. Right. So Networking, like we're doing now, networking. What do you do in your networking, right? What, what do you do in your networking, right? Which people do you connect with, right? Um, it's, really a, it's really a situation that it's, it's sort of important, right? That you need to network. Because to be honest, I've never, ever gotten a job at the professional level that I didn't know someone directly at the club, or I knew someone that knew someone at the club. Never. Never, never, never. And I've coached at a lot of places over the years. So I think it's, it's really important. Networking is really important. 
Now, look, as I was telling Sean earlier, I'm, I'm naturally an introvert. I'm naturally a guy who says, I can step back, right? But I've had to learn to come out of that shell and network. My wife's helping with that, too, because she's <laughs> an extrovert, like, you know, no tomorrow. But uh, networking is really important. Social media. If any of you guys are college coaches, you know that you check social media to see what players are doing on their social media. But you need to be on it. You need to be on it. All right? You need to be on it. Because as I was speaking with uh, some people. It's like, like I said earlier, I said, you know, I've gone up, I go up against people now that the Eric Ronalds of the world, you know, the Landon Dogs are out now looking to, get, to be coaches, right? Or the guys that have been in MLS who now come down from MLS. Yeah, I've been an assistant in that, in that, in that at the Timbers and, and places like that, but um, I still don't have that next level pedigree where they think I have to coach in that level. Can I coach there? Yeah, no issue. Can do it, no problem. Could I win a championship in MLS? Yeah. If I don't believe that, you're not going to believe that, right? So that's just that's just the, that's just the way that it is, right? So I said to myself, what can I do to bring myself to those players? Because some of those players, some of those players who are now coaches, don't use social media because they don't need to. Plan doesn't need social media. Yeah, he's on it, but he doesn't need it, right? You know, so because the things they've done in the game puts them on a, on a big stage. So I say to myself, the next time I go up against an ex-MLS player, an ex-national team player is now trying to come in, will my network – Will my social media allow me to close the gap? It's up to the owners to pick, make the decision. That's not for me. But will my networking, will my social media allow me to close the gap? And then partners, right? Partners are important. And, I mean, uh, Nike, I've, I've had a, you know, an agreement with Nike for over 10 years now, right? And part of that was because I was, I was the first African-American coach to win a professional championship in the U.S., right? So this is a long time ago, 1997. I think it was 97, 98. Um, so I've had a long-term relationship. But, but you understand something, right? That has helped me, right? So when Nike sponsors a team, right? And for all of you, this is how the world works these days. That Nike sponsors a team. I can call up so-and-so and say, hey, can you at least let me talk to so-and-so? And they'll say, let me connect you, right? You know, and that's... That's really important. So even, even if it's like your, your, local, your local coffee shop, your local whoever, if you, want to, if you want to be in that elite level, this is what it takes. It's personal branding. You know, I, you know, I have an agent. I have all these things. I have some people that help them with marketing. But, you know, it's just, it's just what it is. But your personal brand is really important. But your personal brand has to be positive. Because, you know, as a college coach, if you're a college coach, you start reading the kids' social media and it's like all this girls and drinking and poor language. You, got, you might lose your interest. All right. So you got to use it the right way. You know, you got to use it the right way. Engage, you know, engage in the right way. And I've actually done a little bit of studying and saying what's the best time to post. And so making posts on what on what platform, you know, networking, you know, I, I'm I, I'm a, I'm a list guy. So on my list every day, I say, okay, I, I'm going to, I'm going to connect with certain people. So I put it down. I'm going to connect with people today. Just, you know, because you don't want to, you don't ever want to come invisible if you want to be at that elite level. If you want to be at our highest level, national team level, coaching at that MLS level, big clubs, big college, there's too much competition. There's too much competition for you to sit back and say, they're going to find you. Because there's a lot of other guys standing out there that have huge platforms that they, they will find them first and they'll stop at that person. All right, next slide, please. Blank slide. Yep. Why the blank slide? Because this is your slide to make. This is your signature. This is your personal branding. These are your core values. This is your leadership style, your communication style. How are you going to feel that? What are you going to do to feel that if you want to be, if you want to be the best 100% of yourself? That's why I put that slide there. Because I want, it makes, I want you to start to think right now, what can I do 
to find that next opportunity that I really want to lead a club, to coach a bigger team, to coach in, you know, some elite platform at the youth level, to, to go if you, to coach at a top college, to coach at a pro team, pro academy. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? What's that going to look like? Thank you, guys. I'm, I'm ready for questions. Rod, fantastic job. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now, um, for our presentation, as it concludes, I'm going to allow the participants, um, you guys are allowed to unmute yourselves or send me questions. So however you guys like, if you guys want to raise your hand and kind of ask a question on your part, uh, or you can send it to me. So a question I actually got in, Rod, is, let me see, read it real quick. Uh, last Dance, the last dance went on. Um, the MJ documentary, Chicago Bulls. Uh, how do you portray an MJ leadership identity within a coaching identity? Well, for me, I think we only saw a little bit of it, right? We saw, because behind it all, right, we know that Jordan's production company was involved in creating that, right? So he wanted to he wanted to get to see what you want. And here's the thing. For me, I'm absolutely fine with it. And that and also I'm fine with that from that day, right? From that day. Some of those guys in the group didn't like it, but I guarantee you MJ was smart enough to know who we needed to put his shoulder around, right? Who put an arm around the shoulder, who we needed to text or who we need to call or who we need to do whatever after he called them out, right? Because like, if you look at when him and Steve Kerr got into the, when he talked about him and Steve Kerr getting into the fight, he had, he called Steve Kerr that night to apologize. So I don't think we saw everything, but I'm fine with it. I'm fine with his, his drive because I grew up like that, right? I grew up that way. I, that's how I, that's how I grew up as a, as a player. That's what I, I've evolved as a coach because I know that the world's a little bit different, but for me, I don't have any issue with it at all. Fantastic. Before I go and read the next question, um, anyone want to have a question? Um, then go right ahead. Unmute it real quick. Okay, cool. Uh, so, Apart from the, the PowerPoint, which was great and had a lot of information, is there any kind of small advice that you would give, uh, I guess, college coaches that are looking to make that, that jump up, whether it be like USL 1 or 2 or NPSL or any of the smaller uh, amateur leagues out there that are just trying to make that small that, that jump? Yeah, I, I think what I would say is, is that I think network is important, right? You got to know people, right? Because... If you're in the college game, you know sometimes they advertise these jobs, right? And the job's already filled. Especially if it's a state school, they have to do it because it's the law, right? So it's important that uh, you present yourself, right? And if you can afford, right? If you can afford to go out, right? And, um, and go to some trainings, right? Go to some if the NPL teams in your area, USL 1, USL 2 teams in your area go out to those trainings, right? Connect with the coach or if you know a player that's, hey, I want to come out to watch your training, then you, you're seen in that environment, right? So you got to be, you got to be visible too, right? Because even like now, right? I mean, Preki one of my best friends and, and he's assistant coach at Sounders. And so, you know, I get the opportunity to go up uh, and hang out and have, watch training, have lunch and hang out with him. And I've known Brian Smith for years because we coached against each other. And then some of the newer guys, the younger guys on the system, I've just met them through Preki. But don't get me wrong, I love hanging out with Preki. Preki is one of my best friends. But I also go because I want to make sure that they're looking for coaches on the first team, looking for coaches on the second team, looking for coaches in the academy. I want to be, I want to, oh yeah, you know, Preki, ask Rod. Ask, ask Rod, what, is he interested, right? So that's kind of how I see it. 
Um, anyone else? I have a couple of questions in the chat before I go and ask Rod the question. Anyone else has a question right now? Raise of hands. Perfect. So Rod, uh, another question that was sent in was you discussed educational speaker. Um, and you said, if you are not an educational speaker, you will lose um, your players. Do you have an example that you were forced to be in that and gave you the idea that, A, you need to become this educational speaker? Yeah, I mean, it, it, really, it really came from uh, coaching outside the country because coaching outside the country, right, you, you have to learn culture. You have to learn uh, how customs, because culture and customs are different. You have to learn language. So I was actually coaching uh, in Jamaica at Montego Bay United. Montego Bay United is the biggest club there. I play in Champions League. I had a chance to take in the Champions League qualifiers and all that stuff. And um, I made a comment, right? I made a comment to the players. Uh, I said, I, I don't want to just win this game tomorrow. I want to annihilate the team tomorrow. So I walk after training, I walk into, and I'm talking to my um, personal assistant. She's in the office. Hey, Rod, a couple, of the, a couple of the players said that you said you don't want to win the game. And I said, no, I said, I want to annihilate, annihilate them. And she starts to explain to me that, you know, a lot of these guys didn't finish school, didn't finish high school. So they don't have a command of the language that you do. Or even in like Jamaica, which you think they, they do speak English, but they speak what, what they call a pidgin English, a broken English. They have their own dialect, right? So some of those guys only speak that. They only speak it in, in an English that we know when they're speaking to other people that speak that way. So they might speak, you know, if they're up and about for 16 hours a day, they might only speak regular English like once a day. So I had to realize that... Um, when I spoke to the group, I really needed to be very clear and be very precise and be, be able to explain things. And it was really, that was a big thing for me because I was like, I thought I had a great, I thought I had a great team talk, right? You know, because it was like, it was Thursday, I think it was a Thursday or a fr it was a Friday and we were going to play on Saturday. So it was like, I, at the end of the day, you know, I had, had a nice little talk after the players, the player thing, and man, I got these guys fired up and I go into the office and he says, they don't think you want to win, you know? So that was a, that was a big thing for me. Fantastic. Um, I got one more question that's in the text box. Um, outside of that, the ones that have their screens visible, do you guys have any questions you want to ask before my last question that I have in it? Uh, Gerardo, let's, let's go unmute it. Okay, perfect. How's it going? Um, so my question is kind of with core values, right? So I know you have your personal core value and then your pretty sure team core value is probably a little bit different, right? What you expect um, for them. So I know I've been told, right? So your philosophy could change, but your core value doesn't, right? Um, how do you feel about that? And has it had a change with the different cultures that you coach and different areas you coach? Yeah, I mean, I don't think core values, I don't, I take it personally, right? I, I say, I look at personal core values. If your personal core values change, then you change. So it means that you really believe it. And then I look at team core values. So as a coach, my team core values don't change. I expect my teams to be technically proficient. doesn't matter where, who, or how. I expect it. And I will work toward that, right? I expect my players to be intelligent. But here's the thing. I also expect my players to be intelligent to the label, level they're capable of being intelligent, right? So that, that's, really, that's really important. Uh, so for me, core values as a person, core team core values don't change. Philosophy? Philosophy core values don't change. Mm, a follow-up question if I, if I could ask one. Um, so knowing that it doesn't change um, – like say you work for a team and buy-in is important, right? Just because their core values. At what point do you feel that if it's not buy-in in that team, do you just leave or um, do you just push until you get the buy-in or just? Yeah, I mean, if we talk about the, if we talk about the professional level, buy-in is 
may be the most important thing for the group. If they have to believe what you say is right and it can help, because there's two things about professional players. If anybody's played at the pro level, two things that professional players want to do, win and can you make them better? Because if they win, bigger contract. If they get better, bigger contract. So don't get it wrong, right? Don't. We, uh, sometimes we get it twisted and we want to we want to have these things about what the professional game is about, right? Yeah, there's loyalty at some where people said clubs for a long time and all those things. But in terms of leaving, I, I think you can always get buy-in, right? You can always get buy-in. At the professional, it's a little bit easier, right? You get your best players to buy in and they bring the other guys along. And then over the course of time, you move on, right? You you let the contracts go out or you don't offer them what they want and they go look someplace else. So, it's, so it's, there's ways to manipulate buying at the professional level, at the youth level, right? It's the same thing, right? I look at the youth level, you pick a kid in May, right? Pick a kid in May and you, you're committed to that kid for 12 months, right? So if that kid doesn't buy in 12 months, right? Move them on. So you can always get buy-in. You can always manipulate buy-in, right? It might not be, it might be a rocky road, right? But you can always you can always get buy in and and if at the professional level you don't get buy in, put it this way: if Messi is not bought in to the coach, coach will have a short life. Messi doesn't say anything to the to to the ownership, so it's a different story at that level, right? You got to get those guys. You got to get those guys that everyone trusts to buy in. Even if, even in your youth team, if you get the big guys to buy in, then the little the, the guys that are really just role players in a sense, they might not buy in, but they know that if they don't put everything they have into it all the time, those guys will say something to them. Now, as you get older, right? Because you're talking about you 10s, you 11s, there's no such thing as really buy in because the parents are the ones that have to buy in. But once you get to the 16, 17, 18, players have to buy in. Thanks. Fantastic. Um Rod, I got last one last one. If no one else has questions, um, we got actually we'll get, we'll get two more last ones. Okay, I'm going to go with the next one that just came in and then we'll finish out with the next one. How do you work the psychological mental strength with your players any particular way? Yeah, for me, so just give me an idea, right? Every single training session. So I do a spreadsheet, right? I do a spreadsheet, right? That I want to that I want to work on. So on that spreadsheet is technical, tactical, psychological, and physical. So every component of every all those components must be visible every single day in my training session. And I put I put percentages on those things. All right. If it was a recovery day, right, then you know the technical piece is going to be higher. You know, if it's a day before the game, the tactical piece, the tactical piece is going to be a little bit higher. The psychological piece is going to, so based on what I'm looking for, right? So those five things are, are designed in every single training session. So for instance, give me an idea. I might say today, the mental aspect I want to work on is winning, right? So then we can all understand if we're going to play winning, right? Easy way to say is we're going to make sure that a large part of our session is going to be small-sided game. Winner stays on, right? So it's easy to create that. So you can manipulate and design your training sessions to move the group to the direction that you want to go. If you, that's if you want to, that's how you can, the mental strength. And the mental strength is individual conversations, all right? It's not always important. It's important to always talk to the group, but walking off the training ground, you might talk to, Johnny and say, hey, Johnny, I really want to see this out of you. I really want this out of you. I really want this out of you, right? Or I've gotten to the habit of like, when I see a player struggling, I'll text him and say, hey, you know, I saw I wasn't great today. You're good at this. Work on this. So there's all these ways. So it goes back to communication piece, right? And that communication piece is, um, it's always, it's, you always got to be doing it. It's always, it's nonstop, 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 right? That help you? Fantastic. Um, so we got one more. Um, adaptability. How does adaptability play a role in the coach's identity 
And do you have an example that forced you either to become adaptable or, um, or you were for, or, or you were challenged to form that into your identity? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very flexible, but I'm not flexible on my core values. So that's the difference, right? So I'm adaptable, right? For instance, I'll, I'll never forget another story in Jamaica. We're going to play a team called Boys Town. And there's a few guys playing the USL that have played at that club, right? So we're going to play Boys Town. And um, <laughs> we're driving on the bus, right? And I, I was just in shock. So we get, to the, we get to the ground and the grass was cut, right? They cut the grass, but it rained. So all the shavings were still on the ground. And then the field was probably a mixture of rock and dirt with a few with the with the with the grass shavings as the grass. And we were a possession style team and I'm thinking, oh my goodness gracious, we cannot, we cannot do this, right? We cannot play the way we want to play. So literally we get there a couple hours for the game. So I'm walking the field. I at least get the grounds person to rake the field to get the grass sh shavings off, right? So I said to the guys, hey, we have to change. Because I think we're already given the lineup. So I said, we got to make some changes. So we were going to play with a false nine. So I put in a true nine, a big guy. We could just lump the ball forward, right? And then knock down and then play possession. Because there's no way we're going to build out without giving the ball away. So... That was one of the ways that, you know, I, I had to adapt. But core values for me don't change. They just, I'm, it's for me, you accept my core values or you don't accept me. Fantastic, Rod. Um, for the coaches that attended, I truly appreciate you guys putting in the time and coming in and listening to Rod. Rod, again, thank you so much. Fantastic presentation. And I will give you the floor to close it out. If you have anything to say, Rod, and then from there, we'll kind of part ways with the, the webinar and Q&A. Well, guys, I really appreciate it. Look, I enjoy these things, you know, and I, I, I love to see young coaches and I can sense that you guys are aspiring to be something that's really, you, you want something out of the game and you want to give something back to the game. But remember, it's never about you. And everything I just said right now, remember this. From looking at the pictures, look like all of you guys have played at some level, and you know as well as I do, players make the difference, right? No matter what I want to say, no matter what kind of coach I want to be, players make the difference. So keep that in mind, even though we have this beautiful PowerPoint and you come up with all these training exercises, if players don't make plays, the team can't win. You know, hey guys, Sean has my contact info. I'm open, I'm available, I'm, I'm, I enjoy helping. So just reach out if you need anything. Thank you so much again, Rod. All right, you're welcome.